Imagine you're a soldier in any war, anywhere. You're prepared for battle, for the enemy, and you know you might get shot or even killed. Imagine being on the front line though, and suddenly something comes creeping around your legs, a cloud of yellow or green that spreads until you have no choice but to breathe it in, and you begin to gag and to choke as your throat and lungs are eaten from the inside out by the horror of poison gas. I'm Andy Nidell. Welcome to a Great War special episode about chemical weapons in the First World War. The stalemate on the Western Front that persisted through much of the war prompted the most intensive use of chemical weapons in history. Despite an 1899 treaty that banned the military use of poisonous gases, all of the nations in the war used them at one point or another, especially during 1915 and 1916. Considered uncivilized prior to World War I, the development and use of poison gas was seen as necessary by the wartime armies, who were desperate to find a new way of overcoming that stalemate of unexpected trench warfare, that war of attrition that claimed thousands upon thousands of lives every month with no gain in territory. Although it is popularly believed that the German army was the first to use gas, it was in fact initially deployed by the French in the first month of the war, August 1914. They fired tear gas grenades, xylyl bromide, against the Germans. But the German army was the first to give serious study to the development of chemical weapons and the first to use it on a large scale. Let's go back a bit. At the end of the 19th century, many foresaw the devastation that chemical agents could cause in a European war. The Hague Convention of 1899 discussed the issue of using chemicals as weapons, and the Sinese agreed not to use projectiles whose sole purpose was the diffusion of asphyxiating or deleterious gases. Now, delegates from all of the attending countries except the United States signed the resolution. A second Hague Convention reaffirmed the provisions on chemical weapons usage and widened the restraints by prohibiting the use of poison or poisoned weapons. Hague II included a clause prohibiting projectiles, weapons, and materials that could cause unnecessary suffering. Prior to the war, all of the future belligerent nations except Italy, the US, and the Ottoman Empire were signatories of Hague II. Both Hague I and Hague II had good intentions to prevent the creation of new and possibly more awful weapons of war. But in reality, the wording of the contracts was pretty confusing and interpretations differed considerably between countries. So, gas. On January 31st, 1915, the Germans used gas for the first time. It was also tear gas, like the French used, and they launched 18,000 shells loaded with it against the Russians on the Eastern Front, but it failed to vaporize, having frozen in the winter temperature. Chlorine gas was used for the first time at the Second Battle of Ypres a few months later. At around 5 p.m. on the 22nd of April, French sentries in Ypres noticed a yellow-green cloud moving toward them, a gas delivered from pressurized cylinders dug into the German front line between Stienstraat and Langemark. They thought that it was a smokescreen to disguise the advance of German troops. Based on that, all French troops in the area were ordered to the firing line of their trench, right in the path of the chlorine gas. Its impact was immediate and devastating. The French and their Algerian comrades fled in terror. Their understandable reaction created a big opportunity for the Germans to advance unhindered into this strategically important Ypres salient. But even the Germans were unprepared and surprised by the impact of the chlorine, and they failed to follow up the success of the attack. So the gloves were now off, and other nations with the ability to manufacture poison gas could now also use it and blame it on the Germans, as they had been the first to use it. The first of the Allied nations to respond to the Ypres gas attack was Britain in September 1915. The newly formed special gas companies attacked German lines at Luz. When the wind was in a favorable direction, chlorine gas was released from the British front line so that it could drift over to the German front lines. This was then to be followed by an infantry attack. However, along parts of the British line, the wind changed direction and the chlorine was blown back onto the British, causing over 2,000 casualties on their own side with seven fatalities. This risk of blowback 
also affected the Germans and the French in some of their gas attacks in late 1915. Oh, did I say gas attacks? Sorry, the special gas companies were not allowed to call their new weapon gas. It was referred to as an accessory, like a handbag. The horrors of gas warfare caused public indignation both during and after the war. And in 1925, a Geneva Convention outlawed the use of chemical weapons. Adolf Hitler, who had himself been a victim of mustard gas in 1918, adamantly refused to deploy poison gas during World War II. Nevertheless, the major powers retained stockpiles of these weapons, and indeed still do. A chemical weapon is generally defined as a toxic chemical contained in a delivery system, maybe a shell or a bomb. In trench warfare, direct attack was often fraught with difficulties and incurred massive casualties. Chemical warfare was to be an effective way of attacking without direct contact or direct risk. A cloud of gas could be launched toward a line of soldiers sheltering in a trench without danger for the attackers. Now, there were several types of gas used during the war. Here are a few of them. Tear gas. First introduced, as I said, by the French in 1914. Tear gas is an irritant and is not deadly. When they first deployed this against the Germans by using hand grenades, the Germans didn't even notice they were using it. One thing here, though. None of the warring nations believed that tear gas was a violation of the Hague Conventions. Chlorine gas. Just a few months later, Germany had the Bayer Company, the aspirin people, come up with a more toxic type of gas to use. The result was chlorine gas, which was a byproduct of dye manufacturing. Okay, chlorine gas looked like a greenish gray cloud of smoke and was highly visible to the enemy. Chlorine gas is a powerful irritant that inflicts damage to the eyes, nose, throat, and lungs. At high concentrations and prolonged exposure, it can cause death by asphyxiation. An initial attack against the Russians that injured some 9,000 of them so inspired them that they too began to practice chemical warfare. Brilliant. Thing is, you need a lot of chlorine to kill people, and gas masks are an effective deterrent. Something stronger had to be creative. Thus, phosgene gas. This was the next step in the progression. The French retaliated against chlorine gas with phosgene. Now, phosgene was a potent killing agent, deadlier than chlorine. One semi-drawback, though, was that some of the symptoms of exposure took 24 hours or more to manifest. That meant that the victims were initially still capable of putting up a fight, although this could also mean that apparently fit troops would be incapacitated by the effects of the gas on the following day. Colorless and having an odor likened to moldy hay, phosgene was difficult to detect, making it a more effective weapon. It was sometimes used on its own, but was more often mixed with an equal volume of chlorine to help it spread across the battlefield. Although phosgene was never as notorious in the public consciousness as our next gas, it killed far more people. About 85% of the 100,000 deaths caused by chemical weapons during the war. Mustard gas, the poster child for World War I chemical weapons. As if these chemicals weren't scary enough, mustard gas was unleashed by Germany in 1917. Mustard gas was the most effective and widely publicized gas of the entire war. However, it wasn't a particularly effective killing agent, though in high enough doses it is fatal. The reason it was so terrifying is that mustard gas was painful, caused huge yellow blisters, and incapacitated a person just by touching their skin. Gas masks did not work against this stuff. Not only that, it didn't go away like other gases. When other gases were used against an enemy, they would, you know, eventually disperse. The wind would just blow them away. Not so with mustard gas. It was heavy and sunk into crevices and trenches, then stayed there for weeks, months, even years. So the Germans found that it was quite difficult to attack the enemy with mustard gas and then advance to the enemy's position. When you think about it, compared to the other causes of casualties in the First World War, chemical weapons were relatively ineffective. Only 3% of those who suffered an attack by chemical weapons died. Another 2% were permanently incapacitated, but nearly three quarters were fit for active duty once again within six months. However, blindness, 
temporary or permanent, was often a side effect of gas, as was respiratory illness. And death by gas was often slow. So you can see why it got its reputation when those hardest hit were sent home to painfully and slowly die in front of their loved ones over weeks and even months. It was Russia that actually suffered the most casualties, by far, from gas during the war, around 56,000. But everywhere it was the trench soldiers' greatest fear and was immortalized in paintings, diaries, and poems like this one from Wilfred Owen. Gas, gas, quick boys, an ecstasy of fumbling, fitting the clumsy helmets just in time. But someone was still yelling out and stumbling and floundering like a man in fire or lime. Dim through the misty panels and thick green light, as under a green sea I saw him drowning. In all my dreams, before my helpless sight, he plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. Just try for a moment to imagine that horror. We make these special episodes every week or two to go into greater depth into topics that we don't have time to cover properly in our regular weekly episodes. Tell you what, you can check out our special on animals in the war right here. Don't forget to subscribe. See you Thursday.